What's up, everybody? I'm Dave Miranda, and this is episode 123 of Just Give Me Five. I hope you guys are doing great. Continue to be amazing. We got an awesome show lined up for you today. But first things first, I need you to hit that like button, I need you to hit that subscribe, and I need you to spread the word about Just Give Me Five. All right. If you guys caught episode 122, you saw we had none other than the one and only Tay the Crown. And let me tell you, Man, you know, Tay is just, that's a, that's a special dude right there, man. You know I mean? It's like his whole family from the history that they have in Surprise. Uh, I mean, that, that alone right there is just already historical. And, you know, the poetry scene, you know, the poetry uh, story that he shared with us, um, having that in Washington, D.C. at such a young age also, that's, that's, that's beautiful, man. Um, you know, and then I, I believe, because like he was saying, you know, he has the, TD, the TTG, you know, affiliation, but everybody that he's been working with in the scene, you know, because Tay isn't necessarily one of our quote unquote vets that we've had as the normal, you know, individuals we've had on the show, but he's definitely been paving his way in the scene for a real long time now. And I just truly felt that he was somebody, you know, that, 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 that is well deserving of being on our platform. And he did a phenomenal job. And, you know, I was just, we were just so happy to have him on here. And he's just continuing to thrive, man. I'm telling you, it's like every time I look, Tay's just doing, just doing something else, doing something else, making moves, making moves. And, you know, he's really, really like one of the true faces of Arizona hip hop right now. And I'm just we're really, really proud of him, man. And we're rooting for you, my brother. Uh, make sure you guys watch episode 122. All right. But today's guest is one of the dopest DJs to ever touch the tables and is a pioneer in the Arizona DJ community. We're gonna talk about how he became a DJ. We're also gonna talk about how he got on radio, some memorable moments, and so much more. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I present to you, DJ Tiger. What's going on? It's your boy DJ Tiger, internationally known, doing it all everywhere, every which way. And all I'm saying is just give me five. Oh man. So for me, um, uh, my uncle was a DJ and he was a big influence for me, man. So I kind of followed him around and I played drums in like a little drum line, like drill team when I was a kid, and that kind of got me into it. And uh, what happened was I used to carry crates. You remember those days, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I carried crates for my uncle, and I remember he uh, he dropped a record. And as a matter of fact, to this day, I got it framed at my grandma's house back in Pittsburgh, man. Wow, okay. It's, uh, it's the 12-inch 45 of Computer Love. He wow. dropped it, cracked it, and broke it. And he gave it to me because he, really? he couldn't use it anymore. Right. So that became my first ever record. And what I did with that was I could only play the instrumental of Computer Love. <laughs> yeah. Because right? Right. it was a chip in the record. Yeah, yeah. So that was my first ever record. And I knew then that I was like, I want to do something with this. Like, I want to do something. So because I, I carried records and uh, carried crates with them everywhere whenever we did stuff, uh, I got into it around nine. Yeah. And then... Uh, I was about 12. We had a, a family wedding get together. Um, backyard situation. Yeah. It was one of the cousins getting married in the backyard right. type of thing. And my uncle was DJing okay. and he was uh, he was just having a good time. He was like, hey, I'm gonna go kick it. So if you want to jump on. Same uncle that drops. Sa same, same uncle. Same okay. uncle. Yeah. So he was like, jump on. And uh, that was like my first actual gig that I got to play for other people out. And it was all family, so it was all love. Yeah. And then from there, man, I just took it and ran with it, man. I did uh, like some teenage nightclubs back in Pittsburgh yeah, yeah. and did that. Like I, I went around just on the hunt, mm -hmm. just going to different spaces, different spots, asking, yo, can I get on? Can I get on? I was, right. By then, I was like 14, 15 years old. So by the time I hit 16, I ended up DJing at an actual nightclub in Pittsburgh where I had to be like brought in through the back. Right. Yeah. Right. So it was, uh, it was a place called Whiskey Dicks. That's the name of the club. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I DJed there, man, and I had a blast. And I knew I was going to take it with me. 
And then uh, as I got older, I just took it everywhere I went because uh, I left to go to the military when I was 18. Okay. So did that. And then uh, <clears throat> after that, man, I just knew I was like, I'm going to take it with me wherever I go. But I couldn't take records with me no more. Right. So what happened was I went, joined the military, went overseas and thought I wasn't going to get to DJ anymore. And then that was around the time they invented uh, CDJs, yeah, the CD turntables, yeah. yeah. Yep. So what happened was uh, I just started collecting CDs. Right. You know, and then when you're young and in the military, most of the guys, they go out to the bars on the weekends and stuff like that. Yeah. While, while I was in the military, I didn't drink. So for me, okay. uh, the only time to go out was to try to go get on somewhere. So for the first like two years in, all I did was just collect CDs, books and books and books and CDs. Right, right. And uh, yeah, just prepping. And then from there, man, um, when the time came, I remember I was in Singapore yeah. and uh, they had released the CDJ 1000 by Pioneer. Okay. And uh, I remember seeing it and saying, I'm going to cop one and this is going to be on, right? So, so I did, because I only, you know, I was young. I only had enough money to get one, right? right? right. So I got one and uh, took it back to, uh, we were staying in like this house and I wasn't planning on doing anything, right? So I copped it while it was out there because they had just released it. Right. So I didn't have any way to plug it up. So I'm in this house with all the cats that I'm in the military with. It's like eight of us in this house, this gigantic place that they got to stay in out in Singapore. And uh, <laughs> the only way I could get it to like play audio yeah. was to plug it into the TV, <laughs> like the RCA jacks yeah, on the TV. Yeah, yeah. So I did that. And this was when they first came out with the ones where you could like digitally scratch. Right. So, dog, for me, <laughs> I was like, I'm going to do that constantly. So for the next week, I just annoyed the hell out of everybody. In the, yeah, and the, they was like, yo, if you don't stop, man. Right. Like, we, craft, though, <laughs> yeah. Know? So. Yeah. I mean, and I had already been building it from before, exactly. but I, I was missing it because I couldn't do it, right. you know? Right. So, um, kind of working with the best you have. did that and then took that and took it everywhere with me yeah. and then just continued to grow until I bought another one and another one and another one. Right. Now I had my, I had my stock of equipment, had, had my music yeah. and then I just started going and now I was doing the same thing that I was doing back in the States with records, but now I was doing it on CDs. Yeah, so I was able to travel with it more. And this is obviously, this is way before Serato. This is back in 1999, 2000. And you notice how huh, like, like overseas, man, the appreciation for the, for the culture, for the art is just, it's way, it's just so different. Man. Oh, way different, man. So when I was in, uh, when I was in Japan, the, the love that we got as DJs was just, through the roof like we, yeah. they treated us like we were the artists you know exactly, so being out there rocking clubs and venues and stuff like that <clears throat> it was just always a good time it was a good feeling yeah. and you truly were doing something with an art back then you know what i mean like yeah, yeah. i love what's happening with djing now and the technology and the advancements i utilize all of it myself so right. i can't knock it right, exactly. um but back then you had to like like you said hone your crap you had to yeah. you had to stay in it you know, it wasn't something you could do part time. Right. So um, and I think overseas, they understood that. So they appreciated yeah. it more. Uh, I remember doing some stuff out in Korea as well. Mm -hmm. And that was around the time that I got like into doing more stuff for like uh, for like dance crews and stuff like that. Yeah. Like I was always into it because, like I said, when I was a kid, I was doing stuff with drill teams. Yeah. But when I hit Korea, I started seeing more and more dance crews doing stuff. Right. There were some in Japan, but there was only like two or three that were around where I was at. Yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> so from there, man, I was like, all right, I'm gonna start learning more of like breaks and traditional stuff yeah. and classic stuff, getting back to the like the roots of what they were still showing love for yeah. that we in the States had already kind of pushed aside because we were trying to advance forward in hip hop, right, you right. know? So it was good to see how they appreciated everything that we were doing. Yeah, man. So yeah, overseas, definitely a better feeling. 
I don't want to say a better feeling because I I'm not trying to knock stateside, man. No, of but, course, but it's different. But it's it's definitely different. You know, definitely different. Going back to Pittsburgh though, who were some because I'm not too familiar with the Pittsburgh DJ scene. So kind of like who were some in, in locally that were like in, inspiring to you in Pittsburgh? Oh wow. Well, I mean, mainly back then the only person I even looked up to was my uncle. Okay. So so he went by DJ D. DJ D. <laughs> so okay. and uh just followed him uh on the radio there was a DJ that went by the name of DJ Nikki Nice. Nikki Nice. And uh he was somebody who I listened to, but he wasn't he wasn't like an actual uh mix show DJ. He was a, a radio jock and Okay. And uh but I did see him get down in clubs. So I knew he had the skills, yeah. but when I heard him back then, the station in Pittsburgh was WAMO, W-A-M-O. Okay. And so when I heard him out there, I was like, okay, when he's on air, he's this, but then when he's in the club, he's this. So it's, it's different. Yeah, so yeah, but yeah, that, that was pretty much it. There wasn't a ton of uh, other DJs around for me at that time. Cause yeah. like I said, back then I was, I was so small that I only kind of lo only lo looked up to family, right, right? right? And then by the time I came of age to start kind of venturing out on my own, it was time for me yeah. to leave, yeah. yeah. I mean, I gotta say, I gotta give a shout out to the homie DJ Bonix. Uh, he's Wiz Khalifa's DJ. Because obviously Wiz, we know hip-hop, yeah. but yeah. There's DJ ADMC. ADMC, okay. So uh, he's, he lives in Pittsburgh now, he's not from Pittsburgh, but yeah, so he's out there. Uh, there's a DJ out there named uh, DJ Big Phil, okay. which is, uh, he, he's, he's one of the homies too. What's funny about that is, and we're putting this on here, so I'm going to do it, right? Yeah, man. I'm, we're putting this on here. So everybody knows me as DJ Tiger. Uh, my actual real name is Phil. So with me being a big dude and then them seeing DJ Big Phil, the people that didn't know that I left thought that he was me for years. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, man. But nah, DJ Big Phil's out there doing big things. And uh, yeah, there's still some other people out there doing it, but those are the main ones. How I actually ended up on radio out here uh, <clears throat> is I was, uh, I, I'd started DJing down at Jackson's on 3rd. Right. And uh, I got cool with all the homies down there, DJ M2, DJ Mikey Mike, Robbie Rob. Yeah. Like all the cats that were on radio at the time. Yeah. And uh, what ended up happening was uh, a buddy of mine's my brother, DJ Remix, he, he's up in Vegas now. Yeah. Uh, me and him were doing a lot of stuff together and we were doing mixtapes and remixes from Compton, California. Okay. And uh, we got invited up to Power to do a tribute mix for the 10 year anniversary of Easy es passing. Right, so we, yeah. we we got invited up to Friday Night Flavors, yeah. and uh, I remember leaving the club, doing a set at the club, leaving the club, going up uh, to Power, yeah. and Remix had got there before me, so he was already upstairs, yeah. and he's getting set. And again, this is back in the time where Remix traveled with vinyl, so he had to move like early, early. Like if the show yeah. was at one, he had to be there at like eleven, right. you know. Right. So. Uh, I was on CDJs at the time, so <clears throat> um, what ended up happening was I remember going up to the station and trying to get in, yeah. and they were already all upstairs getting ready to, do, to start the show, oh, wow. right? And I was like, oh, man. So I'm trying to get in, trying to, I'm pressing the buzzer, I'm doing the whole thing. Yeah. This is back in, I want to say like 03, 04 sometime, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So if you remember, do rags was the, like the thing back oh, then, yeah. right? Yeah. So I had on a do rag, and <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny story, man. Like I had on my do rag, and I remember standing outside. It's like I want to say it's like 12 30, 1 o'clock in the morning, right? Okay. I thought later, but yeah. Right. Yeah. So maybe even later. Right. That's loads of time. Yeah. This is this is back when flavors was. Still two, and then go to power. Yeah, I left early, yeah, so. Yeah, right. So I want to say, yeah, it was like 1, 1, 1 30 in the morning, right? So I'm up there, I got a do-rag on, and I'm trying to get in the building, and I can't get in. Yeah. And it's one of those moments where, you know how you, like, you try for something your whole life, and you, like, you get to the gate? Yeah. And I'm like, I'm here. I'm right. here. I'm here. Right. And I thought I wasn't going to get in, man. I was like, 
So I started to kind of lose it. Like my energy started to kind of drop. And I was like, man, you know, and then out of nowhere, the night security guard came around and oh, he of the building, of yeah. the building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and he goes, hey, there's an older guy. Right. He goes, hey, what are you doing here so late? And I go, I'm just trying to get in, right. yada, yada, yada. He goes, what happened? Did you forget your, your, your badge to get in? And I was all, yeah, did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yep, yeah. that's exactly what happened, right. right? So he buzzed me in, put me on the elevator, buzzed me in, I get up. And then I get up and I see Squeak, I see Matlocks, I see Ramses, I see everybody, and I get in. <laughs> and then I go in, and as I walk in, I realize as I'm talking to everybody, yo, the security guard just let me in and he thought I was somebody else, and da 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 da. And they go, he thought you were J times three. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow, man. So shout out to the homie J times three. <laughs> So yeah, that was that was how I ended up literally with my foot in the door. Wow. Uh, but yeah, so we did that. <laughs> so we did uh, we did that mix and we had some fun with it. Yeah. And then from there, I became a, a fill-in mixer, like a part-time on the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. And it was uh, it was like an intern position, so it was, it was unpaid. Oh, okay. So you know, you pay your dues. You get the you get the three in the morning, the five in the morning shift. Yeah. Yep. So did that for years. And then uh, in 06, 06 or 07, got hired as a part-time mixer. So I started getting part-time pay. Okay. And then later in 07, uh, I got the night show and became a full-time. Yeah. When, when I got the night show, uh, the first time I did it, I did it with uh, Sandra Pena. That's, that's yeah. That's how long ago this was, right, man. Right. So, because 07 is when I actually met you. I believe it was like 07, 06, and I believe it was at the loft. It is. I want to say it was the loft. It is. Jay Waddy was doing the Sunday nights. So Waddy was doing Sundays. Empress. And I was Empress's DJ. That's yep. Right, man. <laughs> yep. Good old days. Yeah. Good old. Shout out to Empress, man. Yeah. But yeah, we were doing that. Was that was crazy? We were having fun there. To this day, man, uh, one of the last nights we did that night, I know we're going off, but yeah. one of the last nights we did that night, the homie Dumperfoo, who designed my logo, yeah. uh, he was doing a live painting that last night that Jay Waddy was doing that, that night down at the loft. Yeah. And when he got done, I remember buying that painting and I still got it hanging up in my house. Oh, that's dope, man. <laughs> so, yeah, man. So if you want to talk about connecting the memories, man, there it is right there. It's like 15, 16 years ago, man. Yeah. 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 So did all that, um, got on. And then once I got on, uh, to do it, doing the night show, started with Sandra Pena, then went to, uh, uh, Tio Gio. He and I were doing the show for a while and then we transformed it from the get right to the get down. Uh, and then we went from, Geo to Jackie Morales, Jackie Morales to Chris Chavez. May he rest in peace. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, and then from Chris Chavez to the homie D'Angelo, still my yeah. brother. So yeah. I was on with Jello. Yeah. And then after Jello uh, switched, then I uh, was on air with Tino Cacino. So yeah. shout out to Tino. And then they brought in uh, Melani. And when they brought in Melani, I was on with Melani for a few months or so. And that was about the time that the transition started to happen. Okay. Uh, the, the station wanted to do some changes and some directions. And then I was at that kind of place where I had just had my daughter. Right. So, uh, so I was able to have the night show for over 10 years doing the, the nine o'clock shakedown, get down, get right, all those. And uh, when it was time for me to move on, I got to respectfully pass it on to Javen. So Javen was the one who came in and took over. Wow. And uh, man, shout out to Javen, man. Doing She's phenomenal. doing phenomenal, doing big things. Uh, but it felt good to be able to hand it over to somebody who I had like a, a great respect for, so. Yeah, and, just, and she's just a genuinely good person. Yeah, oh, yeah. oh yeah, man. Yeah. If you can think off the top, man, I know there's a lot. What's like one standout moment from those from being in radio, like during those times that you remember, like one time that was just like, man, you know, that was 
or maybe it was somebody you guys had in the station that you were interviewing you know something it's one that you could think of it was like damn i remember that day oh man there's a bunch of them know. yeah um the one that probably stands out the most for me yeah. individually would be um we were doing uh we were doing a promotion where you went to vegas yeah and <clears throat> Power basically went to Vegas and took over. So I remember uh, because of that, I was booked to DJ at the Palms Casino in the Voodoo Lounge. Okay. So I DJed the Voodoo Lounge and then the Voodoo Lounge had an upstairs balcony, but it was on the rooftop of the Palms Casino. So I DJed the, the Voodoo Lounge, yeah. had a great time, everything was great. And then they were like, hey, we want you to go out and DJ on the patio. Okay. And I was like, that's what's up. and. Uh, I, I, I believe it was uh, DJ Scotty B, the house DJ was out there okay. um, and he was wrapping up and they wanted to keep the patio open and they were like, just do what you were doing in here out there. Right. So right. I was like, sweet, that's what's up. And I remember going out there and I remember getting set up to go DJ. Yeah. And it was at that moment that I, I realized that I'm standing on the rooftop of the palms yeah. and the back of the DJ booth was on the edge of the building. So I'm on the roof, One wrong step. Yeah. right? I mean, they had safety nets and everything, yeah, but, you know, still. but it was one of those moments where it was so scary that it got your adrenaline going. Yeah. But the moment of how big the moment was, right. was already enough to have your adrenaline going. And I was like, yo, I'm DJing on, on the rooftop right, uh, right. Of, the, of the palms in Vegas. Like, yeah, man. so that was the one for me that stood out the most. Um, as far as like interviews, oh, there's so many, man. You got, you're in the presence of a lot. Yeah, of them, man. so many. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. There, there was a, there was like a week period where we brought Bash in, and. Uh, this is when you were with Tino, or what, who were you with at the time? As far as. Uh, I think I was with Jello still, okay. and Jello had just transitioned to doing either midday east or, or afternoons or mornings. I can't remember. Okay. But what happened was there was like a gap in between who they were bringing in to take overnights. Oh, okay. So Bash was in town. He was doing some stuff, and you know he had a good relationship with the station. So they had brought Bash in to host the night show for like three or four days. Oh, okay. And I remember doing the show with Bash and just having some fun doing that. We had like board ops in, running boards and things like that. And then I was doing the mix. So that was cool. I think if I ever had to say, like what's a moment that I like, this is a moment for me that I, I wish I would have like handled it differently. Yeah. And it, I didn't handle it poorly. I just didn't know at the time, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, I was DJing at Celebrity okay. and I forget what the show was, but we had, uh, I think it was like Game, Kendrick. It was like a bunch of West Coast cats, right? Yeah. And Game came up to the DJ booth, was like, all right, this, 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 and this. Because I was in the Crow's Nest, right? Oh, At Celebrity. Nice. Yeah. So I'm DJing in the Crow's Nest. So Game came up, said this, 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 and this. And then that was that. And I was like, cool, that's what's up. And that was the game. So talked to him for a minute, knew it. At the time, I knew who Kendrick was but I wasn't solid on all his work, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So when he had came by, he was standing there. This is when he was still real young. Right. And uh, <laughs> and I just kind of talked to him and was like, okay, yeah, cool. Like, yeah, we got it, no problem. And then that was it. And I didn't I didn't take the time to, to have that moment, that conversation, yeah, yada, 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 yada. Yeah. And it wasn't like he was trying to, but right. I think had I known who he was at that time, I definitely would have spent more time engaging with him. You know, I missed out on the opportunity. If I had to go with another one, less celebrity infused or whatever. Um, I remember one of my first ever live remotes, I was DJing at uh, PHX. Oh, okay. It was the, it's Monarch now. Yeah. So it was the night that President Obama got elected. Oh, wow. Right? That's how long ago this was. And it was the first term and we were having a watch party yeah. 
Because yeah. that, that was the big thing back then. You know, that was the, the state of the world and hip hop and everybody was focused in on it. And I remember he, uh, his original ca ad campaign song was Science Hill Delivered by Stevie Wonder. I remember right? it. Right? I remember it. So at Power, that's not on our playlist. Oh, okay. But we weren't on air yet. The results were coming in, the results were coming in, and at like 8.59, they announced that he had officially won. One, yeah. So inside the club, I started playing Science Hill Delivered. Yeah. Well, as I started playing it, the ID for the nine o'clock shakedown hit and we went live on air. So now I'm on air playing Science Hill Delivered. Wow. And I was like, uh, wow, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And I was like, well, ain't no, no way to go but up from here. So exactly. I mixed it with E-40, tell me when to go. Wow. <laughs> and it felt good. I, I don't think I meant to do it that way when I did it, but after I did it, I, I realized like how much it meant to me in that moment, you know? Uh, because no matter what you believe, no matter what your politics are, for me, as, as a, a, a black man seeing a black president for the first time ever and then playing that song and then playing Tell Me When To Go, which was like, it was almost where that met the streets and the culture yep. and they came together. But then they also audibly told the story that the deal was Science Hill delivered and you could tell me when to go. Yeah. And I was just like, yo. Yeah. So that for me was a, a fun little moment, just the creativity that came from that. Oh man. <laughs> so uh, shout out to the homie Fee. Um, Fee is uh, one of the uh, founders and owners of the Jabberwockies. Um, just got to hang out with him a couple weeks ago. Um, he and my friend Ryan Ingram, shout out to Ryan. Um, they grew up together, dancing together and doing a lot of things. So because of that, um, we had always kind of had that network and connection. So, yeah. um, well, Ryan had the network and connection. I, I had the network with Ryan, right? right? right. So I, I, I knew him as a friend through a friend, right? Right, right, right. But my wife is a dancer and uh, she dances in, she's dancing most of the major d local dance crews, right? So, okay. yeah. um, and I've DJed for almost all of them as well, the, the, lo the major local dance crews. So, and, and I mean, you know, shout out Furious, shout out Jukebox, Electrolytes, all those guys. So all the homies, uh, Students Lab, and so many more. If I'm forgetting anybody, man, I, I love y'all. So we ended up going to uh, the show in Vegas. So we went to Vegas to go watch the show and I made some calls. This was right around when COVID was starting to lift. Okay. okay. So. Uh, I was able to reach out to Fee and say, hey, I think it would be dope if you guys could kind of help me out with this idea that I got. Tell me what you think. Right. So I presented it to him and he was like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And I was like, word. Okay. So <laughs> the way it was originally supposed to go was on like the end of the show, like I was supposed to disappear and then come out on stage with the crew and then do it from stage. Wow. Right. But what ended up happening was MGM had basically came down because of COVID saying. We can't have you guys as performers in close contact like that oh. with with guests. Right. right. So they were like, OK. And then they said, you guys can still do um, the meet and greet and all that afterwards. Yeah which we had already had that all set up and lined up. And they said, you guys can still do that. But if you guys do that, you guys still have to be in full character, uh, everything. And underneath you have to be masked up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what was able to happen was uh, we watched the show. We had a great time. And when we went to go to the meet and greet, we're at the meet and greet. I'm talking to everybody. We're doing the whole thing. My wife has no clue. So <laughs> yeah. as we're doing this, 
I turn, I drop to a knee, I do my proposal, right? right? My wife is just blown away. So backstory on her and I, we've been together now for, what is it, coming over 14 years? Wow, man, God right? bless, man, yeah. And this just happened two, two and a half years ago. Yeah. So she, she, she was, uh, she was kind of at that point where she was like, I guess this is just going to be us. Right. Like, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. This is what it is. This just know? is what it is, right? Yeah. So we got our family, we got our daughter, I got a son on the way. So, um, so we knew we were us, but I just hadn't pulled the, the actual real trigger, right? So, so I did, I, I made it official. And it was crazy because she was so stunned and so blown away and so in shock and surprise that she turns and she looks to one of the Jabberwockies and she's like, is this, is this really happening right now? Is he, is he serious? And I was like, they, they can't talk. <laughs> like they can't talk to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was it was fun, man. Um, so got to do that. It's her favorite dance crew, um, and uh, they got to end up being a big old part of it. And then, like I said, uh, since I've been able to hang out with Fee and some of the other guys ever since, and that's with the Jabberwockies directly um to some of the people that they're affiliated with i've done work with them and stuff like that so i'm connected to a lot of different people in the in the dance community that are doing those kind of things like uh i was a tour dj for the uh poriotics the season five winners of america's oh, best dance group okay. and when i say tour dj we did some shows overseas so oh, uh, I wasn't on the actual tour with them, but we did some shows overseas, uh, Qatar to be exact. We were in Doha and we did some shows out there and it was, I mean, it was crazy. And then uh, Chad from the Poriotics and Law from the Poriotics, they went on and did some stuff with the Jabberwockies and the Kinjas. Nice, so man. that was cool. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, that's, and then, and then, you know, we were talking about, you shouted out Furious earlier, you know, you know, you got a chance to, you know, be a part, be a part of Furious, you know, and, and, and work with them as well. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, so House is like family, man. Like yeah, man. we go way back. Um, and then as far as everybody else in the crew, I got mad love for them. We've always been together. Uh, I believe, and if I go back and look, I got to look at the plaques and some of the accolades. I believe I became like an honorary member of Furious yeah. a few years back. Okay. Uh, never was an official member so house get on that right, right, right uh right. but yeah sh so shout out to uh, dj action i saw his the action said the same yeah thing. like i finally became yeah. <laughs> yeah same thing action reflection all those guys um all the djs from the dj side and then um the dancers from the dance side house mr groove all those guys so yeah um shout out to homie johnny castro yeah, so we did we did a bunch of big things with them uh, when House started the the Worth the Weight series, the dance competition that had like the weight categories. Uh, I was one of the DJs that like piloted that whole thing, and they continued to do it to where they would do it like every few months. So they would have Worth the Weight uh, three point one or three point two or three point, yeah. and they kept going. And I believe they're way up there now. Uh, I recently. Uh, connected back with them at, out at Trill, okay. just doing some hanging out. Saw them out there, jumped on the decks and got to play out there. But you know, you, you grow up, you get older, y'all don't get to connect as much as you'd like to anymore. But still doing it, still would love to keep doing it, man. So yeah. Ooh. Um, for me, personally, um, what I love about DJing and why it may, it, it, it's so important to me is <clears throat> DJing for me was an outlet for the creatives who weren't dancers and who weren't rappers, right. but they had something there, you know? Exactly. A lot of DJs become producers, but not all producers are DJs, right? So, um, so I tried to dabble in the production side of it and I had some fun with it when I was younger, but I realized that the live aspect of it was what was more intriguing to me. You know, the actual like performance aspect of it as a DJ. So 
when I go out to do shows, what excites me the most is the reaction, the engagement with the crowd, but giving them something that they don't get when they go somewhere else. You know, everybody can play the same hits, the same stuff. Every club is playing the same songs every weekend. What are you doing to make it feel different? What are you doing to stand out? And that doesn't necessarily mean you got to be on some kind of tons of remixes or tons of scratching. But what are you doing to get to make it into a performance, into a show? Um, when I used to teach kids and I was teaching classes with action and and uh, and furious and those guys, yeah. uh, we used to teach kids. And one of the first things we would tell them, because they would always all want to learn how to scratch. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. we would go, that's awesome. But always understand, even when it comes to scratching, if you're not making music, you're just making noise. Exactly. Right. So have something here that creatively you can deliver, right? So what I always love to do um, is, is add something into my, my sets, into my shows right. creatively to leave that lasting memory or reminder or yeah. funny tidbit. And th that's become more of the norm now. A lot of more people are, are trying to get into doing that, yeah. but they're doing it like, they're not doing it authentically. Yeah. So right. they're, they're, they saw it and now they're kind of copying it. Yeah. But, uh, but for me, that's where the creativity of the art form of DJing yeah. is, is why it means so much to me. And I, I, I try to be as open and honest with everybody that I come across. Yeah. Um, and I, I think everybody has a space and a platform. So for the up and coming cats that's doing what they're doing, I'm not knocking what you're doing, right? right? But to me, if you're gonna do it, do it from the heart, do it with the art and the creativity of it. So yeah, that's why it means so much to me. Ah, uh, yes. Well, um, in, in a word, overwhelming, overwhelming. Um, it's, it's a blessing to know that so many people have come across what I do and they've enjoyed it or appreciated it to the point of thinking of me as someone special. So that is uh, definitely overwhelming. Um, it's one of those like emotional moments where when you think about what you got into it for, it was never to, to be popular or to be famous or do anything. You did it because you loved it, right? So when you became popular or you got some, some celebrity or fame from it, those kind of were like bonuses and perks, right? So um, now as I continue to do it, um, I'm able to be thankful and grateful for everything that I've done, but because I'm still continuing, uh, I'm also able to continue to be excited to still touch more people and more lives. So um, definitely that. If I had to say thank you, obviously, to anybody, um, the day ones, family, obviously, you know, my, my grandmother who raised me, um, I got to put a small story in here of her, right? Of course, go ahead. And uh, I know we, we wrapping up, but man, I got to do this. So <clears throat> my grandmother raised me, right? Yeah. This is back in Pittsburgh. And I want to say it was around 1997 or so, 98 maybe. Okay. And we were coming home from church. My grandmother is very, very religious. She's very devout. Right. So we went to church every Sunday and we're coming home from church and she was listening to her jazz radio station. So I'm in the car. I'm listening to the jazz radio station with her. And then a song comes on, and the song is called Rise by Herb Albert. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'm listening to it, and I hear the saxophone, and I hear everything get to playing. And then I hear the beat drop, and it has that doom, 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 doom. Yeah. And I went, audibly, I, I, I launched out to my grandma. I go, hey, they stole that from Biggie. <laughs> 
So my grandmother goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Off those brakes. <laughs> let's, 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 let me school you on something real fast. Yeah. She said, that's cute that you think that and all, but this song is way before Biggie and them ever thought about doing what they were doing. And as a matter of fact, it was Biggie and them who quote unquote stole it. She said, I'm sure they paid for it, did whatever they had to do. But I was like, it was, it was in that moment that I, that was when I started to learn about sampling more and things like that. But it was also a moment where through music, I was able to connect on a deeper level with the woman who raised me, who's now 80 years old. And back then I was 17 or so. Um, so um, we were able to connect through the music I was listening to and the music that she loved and where that sample brought those two bridges together so that they could intersect. So <clears throat> because of that, when I heard that, I got so excited. Um, and to this day, I always do, to, like throw it in in some of my sets and have like a little nod to her. Um, she's, uh, she's the best, man. That's my grandma, man. She's still alive. She comes out and visits all the time, man. So, so uh, love you, Nana. Um, but yeah, so that's my story on, on that. But that's what got me into the performance aspect of it, the sampling, the live like remixing and things like that. So it was because of that moment, right? Um, but to the rest of the people out there, man, uh, I gotta show love to my family, my wife, my daughter, my son, who's uh, two months away from being here. So oh, nice, yeah, okay. so got that happening. And then, uh, I mean, there's so many people who played a role in my journey that I, I, I don't want to leave anyone out. But I mean, I know we talked about some of the jocks on air, the, the, the Jello and Tino and right. people like that, but I got to go all the way back to the, the three people that gave me my, my opportunity uh, at Power. Uh, the first one being Dion McBean. So shout out to him. Uh, he hired me in promotions. Nice, man. <laughs> um, I got to give my shout out to Bruce St. James. Yes, sir. So he, he was a PD at the time and uh, Carly Hustle. Yeah. Uh, I remember after being on air for about a year, I would kind of always followed the rules and the format and did everything, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, after I'd been there about a year, started kind of getting settled and feeling myself a little bit. Yeah. And I was like, all right, well, I'm gonna I'm flex a little more. <laughs> like, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna do a little more now. Like, right, time, time, to, time to add uh, some of this creativity I keep talking about. And, and I remember going off on air and I remember getting home and, and opening up an email from Carly going, yeah, don't do that. Wow. <laughs> don't do that. Cause you know, radio is radio. So yeah. as much as I love the art and creativity of it, we still had things we had to do and rules we had to follow. And I respected her so much for checking me on it that now it helps me understand like, I understand why she had to do it, but it, it helps me understand that if I ever say something to somebody else, it's never with malice, you know? Right. You know, yeah, like, I'm on the opposite end. Yeah, I'm on the opposite end now. So when I go see cats out somewhere, or when I see younger DJs doing shows, and I'm like, yo, what's going on? I'm Tiger, da da da. They're like, oh, you're Tiger. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yo, set was cool, man. I thought this was dope. I thought that was dope. I don't know if you probably would have wanted to do that part again <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, man. Um, or, you know, just be careful doing this or doing that, you know? And um, even the DJs that kind of came up learning from me, like I got guys who came up and learned from me who I give those nods to like, hey man, love what you're doing, but be careful when you're doing this out and about, you know, when you're doing this at corporate events and stuff like that, just be mindful and, and things like that. And when I used to say that kind of stuff back in the day, I used to feel like I was like, being wrong or mean, you know, being awful to these cats that were trying to get their foot in. And then I thought about it and I was like, had Carly not kind of corrected me on, on what I was doing, I don't think I would have had the longevity that I had in radio. You know, um, the average radio DJ's career lasts between three to five years. <clears throat> yeah, three to five years. I was able to have my show on power started at Power 92, ended when it was 98.3 and 96.1, and uh, for over 10 years, and then even after I handed it off to Javen, I still stayed on and did weekends as an all-star power mixer, 
for a few more years before finally leaving and moving on, man. So, um, so yeah, but yeah, shout out to all those people who came through. So, um, got to give a shout out to Joey boy, like the OGs, the power OGs, uh, bootleg, bootleg Kev, the homie, like the whole ready set fam, Ramses, Geo, Jello, um, the people who I came up with, um, I came up with some people like uh, like Sugar Bear and uh, Yaya Martinez. So those were the people who I came up with and uh, they were all doing big things. Uh, Bruce Trillis, oh, like you yeah. remember him? Like he, we, were, we were all came up together and we were young. Like we were just knuckleheads, man. And then we grew and, and did stuff like that. But uh, shouts out to all them. Shouts out to um, all the, the people who I got to be a part of their journeys as well. You know, um, we, like we talked about earlier uh, off camera, I was Empress's DJ for a while. So yeah. shout out to her. I did some stuff with her. Um, I DJed for uh, a few different like local artists that were kind of coming up and doing things. Yeah. Um, he goes by Anakin now, but he used to go by Cannon back then. But Cannon uh, slash Anakin, um, a few other people. So shout out to those people for just trusting me yeah. and being a part of what, what it is that they were doing at the time. And uh, yeah, it's exciting, man. And, and uh, I mean, I know we talked about it, so I want to touch on it, man. But when you said it, it all came back to me, man. Like you're like, 07 is when we first met, right? And I was like, really? And then when you brought it up, you're like the loft with Jay Waddy and all those guys. And I was like, damn, that's right. So <clears throat> it made me remember, you know, the journey that I was on, like the people you come in contact with who you don't even remember or realize until you take the moment to think about it and step back. So. Absolutely. That was yeah. 16 years ago, and here we are today. Here we are today, man. You doing big things, man. Just give me five. This is just, it's, it's what it is, man. It's hot. So thank you for this, man. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I know everybody's got something going on, but That's man. yeah, I could stand here and talk for forever. So <laughs> <laughs> yo, this is DJ Tiger, man. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate y'all, each and every one of y'all, man. And this has been my five. And there you have it, man. Shout out to my man, DJ Tiger, man. Like a Tiger said, like we talked about, man, we met in 07, back when Jay Waddy was doing the Sunday nights over at the loft on Mill. And he was DJing for Empress at the time. And Wisdom was throwing that all ladies, the all female um, MC uh, uh, show, you know, showcase. And that's where I met Tiger, you know, and just the moment I met him, man, always a good dude, you know, got a just good energy, man, you know, just a real, real solid human being and a very, very, very talented DJ, you know what I'm saying? I mean, he's had an incredible journey for a reason. He's very, very well deserved. And we're just so happy to have him on the show. And uh, man, I wish you nothing but the best, my brother, and nothing less. Make sure you guys are following him on social media. And shout out to my brother, Jimmy Nelson, on the camera. Make sure you guys subscribe to that YouTube channel. Tell a friend to tell a friend. The numbers are going up, but who's counting, right? All right. Well, this was definitely one for the books. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, though. Until next time, stay tuned, stay blessed, stay healthy, and just give me five, y'all. Everything you get, you got the